Hello everyone and welcome to the Edinburgh Napier Built Environment Society webinar 2021. Uh, again, we're back, uh, back into another lockdown and this has brought us into another webinar series this year. Um, it's been, we've had great support from all companies uh, and this is why we've been able to run this again, uh, especially with Garden and Table who are presenting today with us. We were in touch with them last year. Uh, and luckily managed to secure a place this year in between all their busy schedules. Um, so my name is Ben McGarity. As you know, I was previous, um, previous, what do you call it? What's the name? President. President. There we go, Paul. Um, previous president of the society last year. Uh, and this year I've been vice president for my final year and I've handed over to Stefan, which is below me. Uh, he's now our vice uh, president. Um, and I'm joined here with Paul. I, I'm going to hand over to them to let them introduce themselves a wee bit more. Uh, and I hope everyone has got their questions ready for the end. We've got some pre-prepared questions that have already been sent in, which is great. Um, so, yeah, Paul, over to you. Hi there, I'm Paul Chambers. I'm a fourth year uh, civil engineering student. And I, just like Ben, I was a part of the team last year as well with the ENB. Um, I was the vice president. I've s stepped down now. I'm just kind of helping out in the background where where I can. Um, I hope hope everybody that's on the stream today manages to get answers to um, answers to anything they want to ask. Just fire some questions in if you've got any extra, um, and enjoy the show. I'll hand on to our new president, Stefan. Thank you very much, um, Ben and Paul. Thanks very much for joining everybody. Um, it's been a pleasure having the webinar so far. Um, with this webinar. We have plenty more coming up, um, so please, please stay in contact and notify, follow our Facebook page. Um, but for now, I am third year civil engineer um, at Edinburgh Napier and the current president. Um, like again, I'd just like to thank you for joining us. And today we have three guests, um, Gillian, Stephen and Mike. Um, they're with Gardner and Theobald, the company. Um, and they would like to just talk about um, the the projects and the the, the future of the, their company and hope to answer your questions. Um, but yes, thanks very much, guys. I um, hope we can take it away from there. Yep. Just additionally, um, with with Garden and Table, I I was I was working with them um, uh, back in two thousand and nineteen. Uh, as a student project manager, assistant project manager, um, and I gained a, a wealth of experience from there. Uh, and some of you may have joined us as well at the Next Gen programme uh, at the St James's Centre as well, which I think we're going to find out a bit more about today as well. Um, I, so yeah, without further ado, over to you, Gillian. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, I am Gillian Love, and I'm responsible for GNT's marketing within Scotland. Um, and having graduated from Edinburgh Napier in 2005, it's a pleasure to present to you today. So I've got some slides on the screen, hopefully you can see them. So first one, um, g and was established in 1835 and is an independent construction and property consultancy working across all sectors of the built environment. We've got 12 offices within the UK and US, as you can see on the map on the screen. And our core services are project and cost management, and we employ over 900 professionals worldwide. Our core objectives are to deliver a truly world-class service to clients, to attract, develop, and retain the best available talent, and to remain financially strong and independent. We're proud of the fact that we're one of the last remaining privately owned businesses of this scale within our industry. And we live by the <clears throat> values of independence, reputation, progression, ethical thinking and engagement. We employ over 60 professionals between Edinburgh and Glasgow that work on some of the most exciting construction projects in Scotland. In Edinburgh alone, we're project and cost managing a number of major mixed use projects, such as the retail led St James Quarter project, the residential led Newtown Quarter and the office led Haymarket development. Our experience in the education and arts and heritage sector are also strong. We recently delivered two new high schools for the City of Edinburgh Council and the listed National Museum of Scotland Redevelopment. Um, currently on site is the Scottish National Gallery and Glen Eagles Club. 
And during lockdown last year, we were also appointed as QS on the Edinburgh Biomes Project for Edinburgh Royal Botanic Gardens. We're also leaders in the space sector, being selected to project and cost manage the UK's first vertical launch facility in Sutherland. We recognise that career development of our employees is at the heart of our success and we invest in our people and their development. So our chartership programme is highly acclaimed and our success rate for supporting people through their APC is one of the best in the industry. It's a two year programme made up of seminars, assemblies and mock interviews. We do accept cognate and non-cognate graduates on the course. A non-cognate graduate would be someone without an RICS accredited degree. So for non-cognate graduates, we provide fully funded sponsorship through a conversion course undertaken at the same time as the APC. Our current provider of this is the University College of Estates Management, and that would result in an MAC. By the end of the chartership programme, you would receive MRICS status. So the application process for graduates, apprentices, summer placements and work experience runs between the 1st of October and the 26th of February. You can apply through our website and select three location choices. Um, a point worth noting is that where in our regional offices, we might only have capacity for one or two placements for graduates, um, there'll be a lot more availability within our London head office. One last thing I just wanted to mention before passing on to Mike is that our Next Gen programme offers insight seminars, mentoring sessions and guest speakers to encouraging network, to encourage networking and CPD among our young, young professionals. You might see if you go onto our website that our programme has been established for this year coming and if you want any information on that you can just sign up um, and you can get alerts on that. Lastly, we also have a dedicated market intel site, which would be worth checking out. It includes our popular tender price indicator, along with topical articles like mass timber in office construction, decarbonising transport and repurposing retail. So the website to visit for that is marketintel.gardener.com. So I am now going to pass over to Mike Adams, who is a QS in our Glasgow office and who has just passed his APC and he might just go into more detail on this for you. Hi guys, so I'm Mike Adams. I work as a project surveyor in GNT's Glasgow office. Um, I'm going to talk to you a wee bit sort of on the kind of journey I've been on to get where I am today um, and cover a bit of detail about one of my current projects. So believe it or not, it wasn't always my dream to be a QS when I was younger. Um, so as I said, I'll go into a bit of the detail of how I got here. Um, so kind of starting in, in school, I was good at technical things, things like maths, numeracy, techie drawing. Um, but I probably fell into that category. I didn't properly apply myself. I was more interested in playing football, mucking about my mates, that sort of thing. Um, where the teacher would say, you can't do this the night before, I would see that as a challenge. And I would do some of my best work on the bus on the way into school. Um, but coming towards the end of high school, I did have hires and I considered sort of doing a degree as nobody in my family had done this before, being at uni. So it, it did kind of appeal to me as something that I, I, would, I would really consider going a bit further with. Um, at the time, I was working part-time in a leisure centre and I didn't really fancy doing that for another four years while I was going to university full-time. So I began kind of browsing apprenticeships and seeing what was out there. I came across a few QS ones, which um, sort of enabled me to get a degree and work full-time at the same time. So I researched this a bit further and discovered that QS is essentially the sort of financial and legal side of construction. It's cost control of projects, etc. That that sort of thing. Um, so I thought, yeah, I could probably do that for the next forty-five years of my life until I retire. So I began sort of applying for a few, and I was fortunate enough to be accepted into a five-year apprenticeship for a small firm in Edinburgh. It was a company called Thompson Bethune, where they took me on basically full time, working and studying on day release at Glasgow Caledonian University one day a week. So TB was really good for me. Um, it's a small firm of about 30 surveyors between two offices in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, I started with TB in 2013 after leaving high school. I began early on with the sort of day-to-day -day tasks of a QS, uh, admin, filing, a bit of early measurement, um, getting to a company, senior surveyors out to site to get a bit of experience in that, that field as well. Um, as I sort of progressed through my university years, I began running my own small projects from sort of the end of second year through to the, the fifth year of the apprenticeship. 
So it was really good in getting lots of experience early on um, and getting a, a sort of taste of the action from a young age. I uh, stayed at TB for about a year after I graduated um, and I felt as though I kind of got what I wanted from the firm and it was essentially time for me to look for a new challenge. So I left TB on good terms. Um, this was about two years ago now. Um, as, as a PQS consultant, Gardner and Theobald and Turner Townsend are kind of the Celtic Rangers of Scotland. Um, when you get the opportunity to, to come to GNT, I felt it wasn't really one that I was able to turn down. Um, it, it was a fresh start working for new people on a variety of different projects for a diverse range of clientele. At the time that I was making the move, uh, GNT had not long finished the Hydro in Glasgow. Um, so that, that kind of gives you a scale of the projects that I was able to work on, which you, you don't really get at a lot of other companies in this country. So GNT for me was sold on reputation, uh, market share, and the renowned charter ship pass rate, which I'll come to touch on that Gillian mentioned. It's, it's a great company to work for with lots of perks. There's plenty of opportunities to, to go to dinner as events, networking with other industry professionals. In fact, it's actively encouraged in GNT that you do these sort of things. Um, the office itself has loads of good sort of benefits of well, annual trips to the races and um, big do's at Christmas and stuff like that. So it's, it's a really good ethos within the company as well. Um, as I mentioned, one of, the, one of the perks was the projects that you get to work on. So I'll, I'll kind of discuss one of my projects just now. Um, I don't know if I can, there we go. Um, so one of my current projects in my portfolio at the moment is um, I'm the lead surveyor on the Port of Leith Distillery. So this is an iconic project in Leith funnily enough, that um, is the construction of the UK's first tower distillery. Um, it's adjacent to the Royal, Bro Royal Yacht Britannia that you can just see in one of the images there, um, and Ocean Terminal, and it'll also run close to the new tram extension tracks that are coming down Leith Way as well. So uh, hoping to be a popular tourist destination upon opening. It will produce in excess of 400,000 litres of pure alcohol per year. Um, it comprises of nine stories five of which are made up the process, the stills, and um, actually making the whiskey. And then um, there will be an office, uh, a gift shop, double height bar, and a restaurant at the top as well, uh, with fantastic views overlooking Leith. Um, so construction cost is circa £10 million. Pounds. Uh, procurement strategy is traditional two-stage, and it's an SBC, SBC with quantities contract that's been used. Um, currently on site, I'm actually going to visit this afternoon, but at the moment they're tying rebar and pouring ground beams and foundations and the ground floor slab is being poured as well. So hoping to complete um, for April 2022. A few challenges with this project, as there is with any project, is that it's a, a new client. They had no construction experience beforehand. Um, their background is in generating um, alcohol and making whiskey and making uh, white spirits. So it takes a bit of time to explain a lot of things and things that might be natural to a developer client um, need sort of a lot of detail, not a time allocation um, to to know what he's to make sure he knows what's going on. The contractor that was appointed has a personal relationship to the client who likes to try and influence decisions. So this can be quite challenging to manage as well. Um, you need to have good sort of people management skills in that respect. The ground and site conditions, as you can imagine, uh, with the location, there, there's tie rods next to the, the key wall. So the piling arrangement's got to be sort of arranged to accommodate this. There's 129 piles installed, um, each to about 20 metre depths. And the site area is only 700 square metres, so there's very little room for sort of plant storage, circulation, um, all of your, your site management and all that sort of stuff as well. It's, it's a really difficult site and just in time delivery has to be utilised a lot. As in essence, you want things arriving on site as they're being um, erected or as they're being built. Um, another challenge was the paint shed society. So there was an old redundant paint shed that was on the site at the moment. Uh, sorry, when we purchased the site. So rather than just being able to demolish it and put it off, there is a very strange group of people um, in a society in Edinburgh that wanted it dismantled essentially um, in case they ever wanted to erect it again as they felt it was a part of their community. Um, so rather than just demolish it, it had to be broken up and cut into 60 odd pieces of sections and it has been stored in a field and if they want they're allowed to take the pieces and reassemble them elsewhere. Don't know what they've done with it since but it still sits there. Um, 
the coordination with the process engineering as well. The the process isn't part of our contract, but as you can imagine, all of this has got to be going together and being constructed at the same time that we are building the building. So, for example, things like open grid flooring goes around the stills, etc. So it's, it's a complex um, job in the way that we have to accommodate them. They're not part of our project, but it has to be accommodated as it's all happening at the same time. Um, and, and, and financial constraints, obviously, it's a, a, an issue on a number of projects that the client always wants the best product, but they want it at the lowest price. So we have to kind of find the balance of being able to deliver the project they want um, within their budget and time frame also. As I mentioned, um, another reason for choosing GNT for me was the reputation with APC passes. So for those that are unaware, your APC is your assessment of professional competence. Um, this is the route to becoming a chartered surveyor and getting the letters MRICS after your name. Um, there's different kind of routes can be done depending on your level of experience and it can be sort of spread over between one and two years as well. So it's, it's 17 different competencies that you're essentially signed off on by your supervisor up to levels one, two and three. And there are some interesting ones I found, say, things like contract practice. Um, I found it was it was good for sort of filling gaps in my knowledge I didn't even know I had. And there's some not so interesting points as well, like accounting principles and procedures, sort of stuff that doesn't really appeal to me. It's not stuff that you do as a day-to-day -day QS, but it does have to be done as a sort of tick box exercise. Um, once this is concluded, you do a 3,000 word critical analysis of an issue you faced on a project. The steps that you took to um, provide options and the route that you took to resolution. Um, you might think that sounds quite hard, but it's not um, that difficult to come up with an issue because it's construction and everything goes wrong all the time. Um, once that's passed, you're invited to a final interview, which is by far the hardest part. So the format of this is an hour long interview with a panel of three people. Um, this past year, and I think this year as well, it's been held on Microsoft Teams for obvious reasons. The format is a 10 minute presentation, which is on your case study. So you'll essentially demonstrate everything that you've, you've spoke about in this case study and present it to the panel. There's 10 minutes of Q&A on the case study from the panel. It, it says Q&A, but it's really just a grilling. It's you've done this, why wouldn't you do this, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So you, you have to have a lot of kind of practice of on the spot and um, dealing with questions and dealing with sort of curveballs. And then it's a 40 minute Q&A &A on the 17 competency questions. So essentially you need to study everything as anything can come up. It's a totally different format to just sitting on an exam, studying it, thinking about it and putting it back out again, as you do really need to kind of be good at coming up with answers on the spot and kind of racking your brain um, in instant time. It does sound daunting and it does get you right out of your comfort zone, but like I said, I, I found it really useful for filling gaps in my knowledge that I, I never knew I had and that I found and basically en enhancing stuff that I already knew. Um, thankfully, I was able to pass it in December 2020, um, which capped off a brilliant year. <laughs> um, so like I said, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to the next steps in my career with GNT after passing this. Um, I've called this next section of my sort of chat advice, but I'll be honest, I, I don't really feel in a position to be able to give advice. Um, I'm only a few years ahead of you guys. So I've, I've not really been there and done it. But what I would say to those sort of leaving university and coming into the, the next role is sort of find a find a role that suits your personality and where you think you can excel. Um, within quantity surveying, especially, there's so many different routes to it and there's so many different uh, branches of it that you can do. Um, perhaps it's the, the numeracy side. You're not a very confrontational person that appeals to you, maybe an estimating role where you, you get a lot of pre-contract upfront work would suit. Um, if you like being on site, seeing things happen every day, then maybe a contractor's QS position would suit best. Um, so I, I would say it's, it's quite important. I know in this time, especially when um, there, there's so much uncertainty, the temptation is there just to send your CV out to 40 different companies and hope one that sticks. But I, I would aim to tailor um, your CV to a role that you would really like to get in and somewhere you can see yourself developing. Um, I would say ask questions and never stop asking questions. There is no such thing as a stupid question. I've always been a big believer in this, um, that th there's a time and place if you're sitting in a meeting with your boss and a client and you don't understand something and you think it's a stupid question, you can wait until after it. But 
the people around you, once you do get into a, a graduate position, the people you work with just constantly ask questions, pester them, um, because it, it will help you and it will benefit you. Just just be a sponge and take everything in, basically. Um, and finally, work hard. I know it's, it's an old cliche and it's, it gets said to death, but especially in QS, and it can be early mornings and late nights, and it's it's not an easy gig, but it can be rewarding if, if this is the route that you decide to choose into construction. Um, I know we'll kind of touch on the Q and A session later, but if, if there's anything else that anyone wants assist, anyone wants to um, get in touch with, you can contact me, Mike Adams on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer any more questions around from G and T, and especially if anyone's looking as a way into G and T, I'm happy to assist with that as well, um, with application process and stuff. Um, thanks for listening. I'll pass you now over to Stephen, who's a project manager in our Edinburgh office. Thanks very much, Mike, and good afternoon. My name is Stephen Donaldson, and as Mike said, I'm a project manager in our Edinburgh office, but at the moment, then I am seconded to the client office at the new St. James Quarter. Uh, you would uh, possibly know as Edinburgh St James. So we've just we've got a picture of Edinburgh St James there. It's, it's one of the the artists' uh, 3D sketches of it, and um, what what I want to do is basically just talk through a bit about Edinburgh St James, what our role at project managers are, who else is involved in the Edinburgh St James project, um, just about the what's actually being delivered at Edinburgh St James, and also. Um, who the main parties are and then I'll, I'll go on to kind of my background and, and how I got to, to where I am. Um, so to begin with then the slide that we've got here is basically um, th this is the services that GNT are providing for Edinburgh St James. I, I'd just let you know that um, once construction is is finished and uh, in the in the past kind of six months, then uh, it's going to be known as St James Quarter. Um, but ever since I've been on the project, which has been from 2018, uh, the project did start before that. Um, it's always been known as Edinburgh St James. So if you hear me saying that, then it is exactly the same project. Um, as I said, these are the services that Gardner and Theobald. Um, have been commissioned for. I'm part of the project management team for the Shelling Core. Um, on that, then we've got uh, one of our uh, senior partners in uh, Edinburgh. Has he's heading up the project management of it, and there's myself, two other project managers, and our information manager, who make up the Shelling Core team. Uh, we've also got our um, QS colleagues who are based in our London office and we've also got some from our Edinburgh office as well uh, on this project. Our principal designers are from our Glasgow office and then taxa taxation and facilities management again is from our London office. On to the fit out items because obviously a massive project, your shell and core, you've then got your fit out uh, that falls on after that. You've got the residential fit out, then Gardner and Theobald are uh, supplying project management and principal designer. Um, services and then you've got the hotel fit out the apart hotel and retail delivery now the retail delivery um project management team are also seconded to the client office and they're headed up by uh, one of our glasgow partners and then uh, we've got five retail delivery managers who basically manage the the retailers coming in so that includes um advising the retailers of exactly what spec it is they're getting in the retail unit, but also then managing the, the retailer's design process and um, making sure that you've got that interface with the main contractor, Langer Rock, on, on the, the shell and core aspect. And that um, once the retailers are then uh, open, then it's they've got a space that's fit for purpose. Uh, moving on to the next slide, what I've done is I've just put some of the um, the past dates on this project because this project has actually been running for many years now. Um, it has had a couple of uh, uh, dips in the uh, the progress of the project, um, but then that's that's to do with market and conditions as well. Market conditions as well because you when you're on such a big project, then you have to take the market into consideration. Um, so as it shows there, the outline outline planning 
um, was granted back in 2008. And then from there, we had a bit of a financial crisis from 2008 to 2014. But then the project was then resurrected in uh, 2014. Um, <clears throat> as I said, I've been on the project since 2018. So it was a previous uh, GNT team that uh, has been on it since uh, the the appointment in 2014. Most of the team come on well, the stage three. Um, design was taking place and then the procurement and um, we brought the contractor on board in October 2016. That contractor was Lang O'Rourke and their, um, their contract is to um, demolish the old Edinburgh St James, dig down for the basement car parks and then uh, build up from there um, and they've had from October. 2016 and the estimated completion was October 2020 so they had four years to do that obviously um, other things in the market has then happened um, as in Covid so we then uh, weren't able to open in October 2020 um, so we have uh, and we are actually going through a revised program at the moment and we're working with the contractor Lang O'Rourke on uh, the their completion date but also you don't just have to take into account their completion date we've also got the retailers that then come on board because at the end of the day you wouldn't have four levels of retail space plus uh, food and beverage offer offerings on um between those four levels and the fifth level if you didn't have any of these uh places uh open then there's no point in having the the, the rest of the scheme open um so I'll just move on to um, who's actually involved in this project um, because you do have um, a lot of different consultants, contractors, specialists, but ultimately you've got your client who starts this off um, and who um, we then report into is a company called Nuveen, um, formerly Tia uh, Henderson, and they are the development managers. They sit in the, the client project office. We then also, as I said previously, I'm seconded to the client project office. And we sit with them um, as their project management team. The main contractors, as I said, is Lang O'Rourke. Um, they've got multiple sites throughout the UK. They are a tier one contractor and they are used to um, large scale complex projects like this one. Um, what we've got is uh, the original design, um, which was part of the, the stage three, then the client brought on um, the consultants and the designers that, they were, that were then required in order to progress the design. So that was BDP, Arup, Tufsud, Sweco and Open. And what, what they did was they, they created the, the stage three design, which was then procured out on a design and build contract, uh, an SBC, SBCC. And um, once Lang O'Rourke um, were the, the winning um, bidder, then these consultants were novated over to Lang O'Rourke. So they were part of the client's team. What you do is there's then a contractual mechanism where they are then uh, taken over and they then work for the for the contractor. The advantage of this is that they know the, their design. They're the ones that have created the design. So you've got these synergies um, of moving the, the designers over and they can just continue the design on. What you do need to do for this design and build is keep on a compliance team. Um, so we've got Alan Murray Architects, we've got Arup, uh, Tufsud, Jensen Hughes Company, um, who are the fire consultants. And we do have a lot of other um, specialist consultants on this job that can then help with the different aspects, for example, acoustics, um, air tightness testing. Um, so the, the the list is is endless on this one because we, we do need a lot of different parties when you've got such a wide variety of mixed use um, on this scheme. So just moving on um, to a bit about the actual build. Um, the overall development cost um, is estimated at about £1.2 billion. That is not just construction costs, that includes um, the the marketing and the leasing and the the overall cost of the scheme is is estimated at about 1.2 billion um the overall uh, floor area is about 1.7 million million square foot um 
of which the retail and food and beverage take up about a million um, square foot of that one. Um, as I said, um, with the existing St James Centre, then Langer Ork did have to come in and demolish it, and then we had to dig down to allow for the three levels of basement car park. Now, that consists of about 1,600 spaces uh, into Edinburgh. So um, in order to, to dig down, that was actually quite a big operation to then get the material away because we're not going to be reusing any of that material um, on this site. Uh, and uh, what Langer Work had to do was, because it's a city centre site, actually had to create a logistics plan of um, how you can get that sheer quantum of material away from the site um, to uh, um, uh, a site out slightly outside of Edinburgh and then you can sort it out about what material can be reused on uh, other sites and what unfortunately cannot be reused and has to go down as waste. Moving on, um, we've got the W Hotel that you can see, uh, sorry, in the previous slide. Um, <clears throat> that um that's the the heart that's a five star w hotel um, which consists of 255 rooms we've also got a five screen uh, boutique cinema which is up at level five the apart hotel again is up at level five residential we've got 152 apartments which uh, we've recently uh, got the fit out contractor on board and they're going to start fitting out the 152 apartments um, which again is from level five to level eight. Um, you've got the public realm uh, where we've got event spaces. We've got three different event spaces which can be used for external events. For example, while the Edinburgh Fringe is on, then um, you can then have um, different uh, events there from them. Um, but the three different events are all at ground floor level, and then there's also event spaces up at level five and level six of the development as well, which will be outdoor areas. They give fantastic views. On the W Hotel, then this is, um, this it does include uh, retail at the retail levels. You've then got some hotel rooms um, at the, the upper levels. And then from levels 10, 11 and 12, you've got a restaurant. You've also got a bar and you've got a viewing gallery up at level 12. Uh, I was actually up there um, late last year and it does give you 365 degree view sorry 360 degree views of edinburgh um you got fantastic views of the castle and uh, all the way down to leith and over to fife um just moving on to next slide um just to give you a, a wee bit about um and a few statistics uh, just so you, just so you can understand the, the sheer size of it because the the old edinburgh st james i don't know if you can remember it it was um very much just a, a walk through um the the shopping centers with shops on a uh, shopping center with shops on either side so what that does is it just um all you basically see is just the walkway and then into the shops. You didn't appreciate the, the sheer size of the site because um, you did have government buildings. You've also got historic buildings on it and uh, John Lewis there as well. There we are retaining John Lewis, uh, the, the building there and then building around it. Um, but as I said, just a few kind of statistics. Um, so the excavation, as I said, we had to excavate down for three basement car park levels. Um, that's equivalent of three and a half thousand swimming pools. The concrete in the basement is the equivalent of 150 double-decker buses. Um, the steel, um, we've we've got a lot of steel on this job. Um, just being able to get that to site and the logistics of that. Again, there, there's a whole team for Langer Rock that deals with logistics and being able to get materials to site. These guys are, um, as Mike actually um, said on, on his project, they're using just-in-time. Lang O'Rourke, again, use uh, just-in-time delivery methods because there aren't any loading uh, and unloading um, slots available for waiting lorries to then come in, offload, and you've then got a lay-down area. Unfortunately, the site is just not big enough to, be, to allow that, so what happens is the, the lorries come in, the majority of the steel is in it um, already, but uh, your lorries would come in and the cranes would then 
take your steel and put that in place. As soon as the lorry was then finished with this, with its steels, it would then exit site. So you have very much got to make sure that your logistics and your crane time and your hook time it ties in with your deliveries. So that is a whole coordination piece that Langer Work have got a ded dedicated team for. But as I said, with the, there is a lot of steel, so about 50,000 tonnes of steel on this job, which is the equivalent of about 7,500 Range Rovers. Um, and then if you laid all the steel out, um, that would it's the equivalent of going from Birmingham to London. Um, so on on the actual uh, construction of it and, and the structure, then uh, we are using metal deck and lattice slabs. Uh, again, these are then craned in um, just for efficiencies. And then um, you've also got concrete pours on, on that as well that will um, that require concrete pumps. And you've then got your years that come in. Again, that's part of your logistics. Um, <clears throat> but that equates to about the, the whole um, area, equates to about 30 football pitches. Uh, clad in and curtain wall, and we've got lots of different materials on the exterior of the building. Um, as you saw in the previous slide, we've got the W Hotel with your Rimex bronze going around it and glazed. And that, um, for the majority of the, uh, the levels uh, one to four, you've then got um, the um the cladding on it in the facade um and a bit of curtain walling as well um as you're going up through the levels and then into the retail levels um so as a as a very quick kind of overview of this mixed use development um then that kind of gives you a wee bit of a flavor i know i haven't really gone into too much detail but uh unfortunately it's it's that size of development that if you start going into detail, I could be here all day um, chatting about it. If you do want to come and actually see the Edinburgh St. James project, sorry, the St. James Quarter project, then feel free to, to just walk past and you'll see the sheer scale of it. Uh, if you are in the centre of Edinburgh, if, if um, obviously restrictions permit, um, then you'll be able to see it go by the at the moment, then the majority, as I said, the steel's in, uh, cladding, uh, curtain wall and uh, facade is up and the Rimex around the hotel. So it is, it's actually a really um, good point of the project to go and see it as it is at the moment. Well, you've still got a contractor on site, still some scaffolding up. Uh, most of the tower cranes are down, but you have still got tower crane up, tower crane up there so that you can still see um, just the, the logistics of it and, and the size of it or about getting um, vehicles in and out of a city centre site of this volume um moving on to kind of how how did i get involved in this project well I've, i didn't take your normal kind of or what is a normal route um to university um i left school back in 2004 and um, so i'm a wee bit older um than uh, some of your other project managers um with my experience. So as I said, left school back in 2004, initially went in and worked uh, in the hospitality industry. Uh, really did enjoy that, gave me a lot of skills, got into, um, and I did their management program um, and managed to work my way up to um, becoming an assistant general manager. Um, so what that does is it gives you a lot of people skills and as a project manager, fundamentally, um, I have to interact with people, I have to manage people. Um, so uh, again, that gave me a lot of a lot of experience, but um, I knew that hospitality wasn't for me. So went and did uh, an apprenticeship, a joinery apprenticeship, which was uh, really beneficial for, for my job um, that I'm doing at the moment because it gives me that hands-on construction experience. Um, so it's not only are you then discussing um, the design or the actual construction with the design team of the contractor, but you can fundamentally understand it because you've been there, you've done it, you've got your hands dirty. Um, unfortunately, due to the recession, which actually put part of the St. James, actually put the St. James Quarter on hold, um, it also hit um, the joinery company I worked for. At the time, at its peak, it had around uh, 60 joiners. And unfortunately, 
the Friday before the Christmas holidays in um, back in 2010. Uh, then the the directors unfortunately took the decision that they had to downsize because the, of the recession and I was one of nine joiners that got laid off on that Friday just before Christmas, um, which was a bit unfortunate, but what it did, it gave me an opportunity to then go to college, get my HNC in construction and project management, and then I move on to university. I went to Heriot Watt University uh, out at Rickerton. I went in uh, second year. There was quite a few uh, entrants from uh, college into second year uh, when I was there. Uh, quite a few of them actually did have a trade background, uh, either joiners, uh, carpet fitters, uh, stonemasons uh, I had on, on my degree. So that actually really helped with uh, my time at university because as I said these guys have got the actual practical construction knowledge that that you can learn from so it's not only about learning the academic it's also about learning the actual on-site um, experience. Left university in 2014 and went and worked for a few different companies uh, you've got some consultancies in there, Faithful and Gould, Macy Innovations, Gardner and Theobald, they're all the consultancies. So what they do is they act for the client, they're then between uh, from the contractor to the client and uh, they're there to, to make sure that the client is getting what they've paid for. Um, fair enough, you've got your compliance teams as well for the designers, but ultimately the project manager is there to manage that process. Um, did also work for uh, Contractor, uh, Paradigm Reinstatements, that uh, deals with insurance reinstatements. So what we did there was, um, say for example, your your house got flooded, uh, one of your uh, pipes burst, or unfortunately there's there's then a fire in your, your property, then uh, I was the contracts manager who would then lead the team uh, to come in and um, put your house back together again um, and that was through the insurance companies um, so again some really good practical on-site experience uh, then I went and worked for Macy Innovations they're actually a very small consultancy who specialize in airports um, where I went down to Luton Airport and I was part of the team that I uh, was part of the Luton Airport expansion that doubled the size of the terminal so that includes the security search area as in the, the area that you go through to get your uh, get your bags and yourself scanned before you then go into the airside and uh, again the, the kind of the baggage belts uh, increasing that size and just increasing the size of the terminal as well they doubled the size of Luton Airport um, there is still ongoing projects down there where they are bringing um, rail a rail station into and rail link into the airport um, that'll be really good uh, once because uh, it just it allows for the infrastructure to then be able to manage the increased passenger load. Um, I also worked at Stansted Airport uh, within their business as usual um, team. Um, still working for Macy Innovations. We were just the project managers uh, seconded to to these airports. Um, and uh, what we did for the business as, business as usual uh, department was basically do uh, lots of uh, development management projects and feasibility studies on um, from the different departments within the airport. So you've got your security, your commercial, um, your land side uh, operations, your airside operations teams, etc. You've got all your different companies that then work within there, your airlines. Um, so they all then submit what projects they they need to then upgrade their sections um, or their areas and uh, as development managers then we would then do a full feasibility and appraisal study on there and then determine the budget um, for the up and coming year uh, once we then decided on exactly what projects were going ahead we'd pass that on to the project management team who would then take that forward appoint contractors and designers um, as uh, part of the projects um, now this was uh, for me absolutely fantastic uh, experience because in an airport a live environment then you had to um, make sure that any of the projects that you were then doing didn't interfere with the live operation of the airport um, so that comes with logistical challenges um, and you had to then 
fit your construction around a live airport, make sure that your health and safety is there, make sure that you're not impeding any of the passengers um, and their, their experience of uh, the airports. Um, <clears throat> What that did was that was a stepping stone that allowed me to then um, come back up to Edinburgh uh, and, as I said, get a job uh, with Gardner and Theobald. And I've been seconded to the client office at the St James Quarter um, for the duration of this project. Um, obviously, as I said, the, the project is still ongoing. Um, we're, we're, we're at the moment we're, we're resequencing the, the program um, just to see about the completion and then coordinating that with all the, the different stakeholders um, on the on the project and there will be an update um, from the client um, going out to the um, the wider community of uh, revised opening dates etc uh, in due course. Uh, while doing that then I um, also uh, decided that uh, to help my career, then it would be best to undertake the APC um, programme from the RICS, um, which I then um, used a live job. I used uh, one of my work streams on the Edinburgh St James project um, as my case study. And as, as Mike has told you about the, the program, I then had to do all, all of that as well. Because I, I do have um, a construction background and I had um, had quite a few quite a few years experience before that, then instead of the, the normal 24 month route, then um, with my experience, then that was compressed to 12 month route in order to pass my APC. I passed my APC back in June. Um, again, during COVID times, um, so I had to do mine over a video conference, but I um, uh, successfully passed my APC and uh, like Mike, I've, I've now got uh, MRICS after my name. i um, <clears throat> just like to uh, conclude on a, a wee bit of advice um, on kind of, you, you've heard my background, but what, what I would say to any graduates um, who are graduating um, put aside uh, conditions of COVID and Brexit going on with the market at the moment and the instability in the market, then what I would say is don't try and do too much too quickly, um, as in get into a company and just take your time for the the first um, kind of couple of years you're in there. And what, what I mean by that is, yes, go and work hard and uh, you need to go at um, a fast pace because the industry does move, construction moves quickly, but take your time in your career. As in, yes, go, uh, my advice would be go, go and get chartered if you can and if that's something you want to do, but make sure that you don't try and do too much too too quickly because um, what, what you will see is a lot of movement in, in the different companies that, that you do work for. And yes, there's always going to be opportunities, but make sure you have a solid foundation first because if you don't have a solid foundation, then as you guys know, as you start constructing the superstructure, then it's all just going to fall over. Um, so best advice I can give is um, once you do uh, get into a construction company, albeit contractor, consultancy, any, any of them is, as Mike said, ask questions, but ask questions about the actual how does the construction work? I know it sounds like a daft question or to, to be asking um, as in how do you build a building, but there's that many different ways. Then actually go into the detail, get on site. When I worked for Macy Innovations, then the director in that company always said, if you're not on site at least twice a day, you're not doing your job properly as a project manager because his philosophy was always, you have to know the detail. So how do these steel connections go together? Your concrete pour, what are the challenges when it comes up to concrete pour with your rebar, making sure that actually once you've got the, the deck down and the rebar on top, there isn't rubbish in there before you, you pour your concrete. Um, it's all these little things that go out with the engineers, the compliance team, because or even go out with the contractor and ask these guys questions. They, they'll be so happy to answer the questions and talk you through it. They might be busy, but they will still answer these questions and make the time to do it because the more you learn the earlier in your career, the better your career you'll have. So as I said, just take your time and 
learn as much as you can. You can never stop learning, no matter who you are and what your position is. Thanks very much for listening. And that's it all from me. Thank you again, Gordon Thiebold, uh, Gillian, Mike and Stephen. Uh, another great presentation uh, filled with a load of information for everyone that's watching. Um, again, an insight into uh, what g t can offer from a previous Napier student, Gillian. Um, and then going on to Mike, uh, who presented another uh, different career path uh, that's available, that he had taken. Um, you know, it hasn't the route that everyone always the most well the normal route um, that people seem seem to always assume is always uni and then straight after you're straight into a job whatever. And again, Stephen uh, highlighting the St James's Centre. A lot of the audience even they they probably know about St James's Centre being a, a massive impact on uh, probably traffic congestion within the city centre <laughs> from construction that's going on. Uh, and being a massive, massive uh, infrastructure that's going up, uh, and a, an impressive one as well. Um, we had some questions brought in uh, that were pre-prepared uh, from our students that signed up previously. I'm going to hand over to Stefan, uh, and he will run the Q&A. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, so this question is from Matthew Orr, uh, which is saying, which... BIM software, would you say, is the most commonly used across the industry? Um, I think that's either towards Mike and Stephen, unfortunately, who wants to, who wants to take the risk of the question. We, we uh, had a discussion on this point. Um, a bit of it, speaking from my own personal experience, I, I don't think BIM 3 is as um, popular as it was first hoped. Um, my, I personally think it's kind of geared towards um, public procurement projects and stuff, so, which, which I've not really had any experience on. So from my personal experience, I'd say between zero and one, um, there's not a great appetite for it in private clients, I find. Um, so generally not not up to, to level three as, as maybe they would have first hoped when it, it was brought out. But I'll, I'll let Stephen sort of talk about his experience. Yeah, I'd completely agree with that one, Mike. Um, my past experience was uh, kind of around kind of uh, BIM level one um, on St James Quarter. Then we're kind of a, a BIM level two plus. Um, we do have the three D models, which are then used as construction issue models um, by all the different uh, design teams, innovative design teams. Um, so, for example, we, we've got a landscaping model, we've got the structural model, the architectural model, but then they are then put together and we do have a single um, federated model. Um, we, because it's a, a kind of two plus, it's, it's got that plus on it because we do use uh, an online kind of database software, um, Viewpoint for Projects, where everything is then on this project is uploaded. And that's a central area that um, the contractor, client, compliance team, project managers, we all use this centralized area. The This is a, a live area, um, but it's not a, a cloud-based area, as in you can't make changes um, to it. You have to then download, for example, the model if you are then making changes and then re-upload. Um, so that's where it's kind of a BIM 2 plus rather than a full BIM 3. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, just, I was just going to input to that just to say that um, as a company, we have got quite a lot of experience using BIM Level 3 on projects such as new school buildings um, and university buildings. So it is something that we have got the experience of um, across the company. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, I hope that answers your question, Matthew, if you're with us now. Um, from a student's point of view, I think uh, BIM is getting pushed towards us. Um, quite a lot, so it's quite good to actually hear it from a from like a career point of view, you know, instead of the uh, like a, a student lecturer sort of view. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, and the next question is from Henry Piper. Um, he's actually a, a third year. He's a a student. No, what works the same as a student. Um, so this one is: What desirable attributes do you look for in those applying for your graduate positions? Um, I'll answer this one. So um, we look for a true passion and interest in the industry. 
Um, strong commercial awareness is important, a drive and a motivation to learn and to progress. Um, and a good understanding of the role and of the firm, which really goes above reciting information um, that's available on our website. And probably lastly, a willingness to take advantage of all the opportunities available. Available, There are a lot of opportunities available in the company um, for career progression. It's something that we focus strongly on. Um, and the ability to build relationships both internally and with external consultants is really important. Great, awesome, thank you. Um, I think it's um, with obviously the the website, the 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 link that you gave us. Um, we'll make sure that we can send that to people um, to make sure that they're they're on the right page. Um, and was it we can was it from the first of October to the twenty sixth of February? Did you yes. say for the yeah? Yes, cool. um, yeah, so it finishes on the twenty sixth of February. So if you just visit. In fact, if you just visit the Gardener website, um, there's a there's a kind of tab there that you can go into, and there's a lot of information on the website about our chartership program, about our graduate placements, about our summer placements, um, and there's a link through that to apply. So it's all quite straightforward if you go on the website. I'd, oh well, I think we've more or less answered the next question from Finn and Alexander. Um, I think maybe the only thing we could cap on is maybe how long does it last? Like how long do the placements and internships last? The the yep. So the graduate um, is a full time employment. So if you're if you're appointed, that's you. Um, and the summer placements normally span from eight to twelve weeks across quantity surveying and project management. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, is there any more? I can't remember. Oh, this one is from me. Hallelujah. Um, this is the GNT Hybrid Next Gen Programme that I did see advertised on your website. Um, mm. Could you enhance on this um, just to give people an insight um, on what you are working towards? Yeah, of course. So our Next Gen Programme has been established now for a few years. And it's grown and grown in popularity. Um, we've got partnerships across the industry, uh, particularly in London and elsewhere. Uh, basically, it's a programme of events. So prior to lockdown, we delivered things such as speed mentoring sessions, um, coffee catch-ups. We had guest speakers. You know, guest speakers would come in and deliver presentations to our next-gen staff. So next-gen is basically anyone in the company that, particularly young professionals, but it's open to everyone. It's open to anyone externally as well. If you want to go onto the website and put your details down, you can get involved in any webinars that we've got going on. So the hybrid is basically a mix of events over the next year, which will take into account online webinars and hopefully at some point soon, um, physical events as well. So our programme has been established for 2021. And if you, there's an article, as you said, on the website, if you want to jump on, then you can read a bit more about that. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much. I um, hope um, more keen people will go and take an insight on that. Um, I think it's great to to have, like you said, an article there to to read and to look forward to. Um, I think that's the final question. Um, for now, I'll pass on to Ben and Paul. Um, who I think will, if they've got any more questions or. Yeah, um, it's just if anyone else has got any more questions, I know uh, Annie's on our Facebook page, uh, sort of running that side of things. If anyone else has got any more questions, if you just pop them in the comments below uh, and we'll get them on here. Uh, for now, unless, uh, Paul, have you got anything else to say? I've not got anything else. I've just checked on the Facebook as well. There's not been any questions come in as of yet. I've not seen anything. Right, um, no worries. Any more questions at all? Uh, you can uh, contact me. Uh, I can pass them on uh, to Gillian. Gillian can then uh, get the question solved for us. Uh, again, thanks very much, Gillian, Stephen, Mike, uh, for uh, joining us today and for your time. Uh, Gillian, especially for being in such close contact with me since last year uh, and getting this, making this happen. Um, also, a uh, thanks to Fraser uh, in the background there running our IT on the call uh, and Annie as well that's in the Facebook page. Again, uh, any other questions, uh, they can be posted to me and this uh, webinar will be posted onto our LinkedIn pages 
and it'll be posted onto YouTube uh, for anyone that's missed out. All right. If anyone else in the panel has any more anything else to say, uh, we can wrap up with that. That's that great. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, guys. And we'll see Thanks. you in the next webinar with Swaco. Thank you. See you later. Thank you.